Have you ever been given the advice to just be yourself? Anybody ever received that advice, just be yourself? Um, it sounds like a no-brainer. I mean, who else are you going to be? Like, oh, I was going to be him today. Ah, I guess I'll be myself. No, the, you, the advice, hey, be, just be yourself. You're not going to be somebody else. That just seems like a no-brainer. It's just, why would, you, why would you even give that advice? But it is very good advice. It's usually given when you go in for a job interview or you're going to make a presentation of some kind. Or if you're a teenager and you're like, yeah, I really like her, I really like him. And your friends say, hey, just be yourself. You, you get that because you're about to make a presentation, right? You're, you're about to, you know, I'm going to woo that person. I'm going to win their heart for all eternity and we will become one and we will be, our souls will be meld together for all of eternity because it's love and it's got to be the real thing, right? So what we're trying to do is impress the other person. So our friends might say, hey, just be yourself. That is extremely good advice, but it seems like bad advice because what else are you going to do? You're going to have to be yourself. The idea is just to be who you naturally are and don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to impress that person or don't try to be something you're not to try to win them over. Just be yourself. Just be yourself. Today I want to address a topic that a lot of people struggle with. And due to a lot of verses that have been misinterpreted or taught out of context, Many people have a difficult time wrapping their minds around who they are or what they have in Christ. We don't really understand all that we have because of what he's done for us. <clears throat> At the same time, Christians often find themselves being miserable or feeling negative about themselves in one way or another. We, depression and anxiety are huge, even amongst Christians. In Christian circles, you can face depression, you can be anxious, you can be so full of worry. Even as a Christian, we, we do this kind of thing. I promise you, Satan has absolutely no problem at all if you have a negative mindset about your life or about your value. He's okay with that. If you are feeling negative, camp there. He's all right with that. You go ahead and feel discouraged. If a Christian can be directed towards negativity, the threat has been extinguished in that area. You know, as long as you're feeling sorry about yourself or you feel like you have no value or you're feeling anxiety or whatever, what are you going to be doing for God during that time? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot because you're consumed with those emotions. Satan's okay with you feeling like that. And the truth is, every one of us are going to run into that at some time or another. We're all going to feel those things. Negativity breeds negativity. It doesn't produce anything else. So if you want to know what negativity is going to do, that's all it's going to do. It's going to add more negativity. That's, that's all it does. So this, this is where the battle takes place right here. Let's just look at this verse. Proverbs 3 and verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. If it is possible to get us to do anything outside of the directions given in these three verses, Satan has us crippled. Just those three verses. If you will look at those three verses and say, that's where I need to keep my focus, right there. If he can get you to mess up on one of those things, just, just don't do one of those things, you're done. You're, you're crippled. We're supposed to trust in God. Don't trust in your own understandings because, you know, there's a lot of times where I thought I understood something and then I, later on I understood that I didn't understand. I just thought I did. If I only knew then what I know now, we've all, we've all heard this, maybe we've said that. Man, my understanding then does not compare to my understanding now. God says, I want you to trust in me and don't lean on your own understanding because a lot of times our own understanding will lead us astray. Even though we thought we nailed it, we might have messed it up because we're leaning on our own understanding. Acknowledge Him in everything we do. Don't be wise in your own eyes, but reverence the Lord and stay away from sin. There's a lot packed into these three verses here. If we omit even one of these things, we begin to slide down a very slippery slope. Let's try it for a minute. Let's say we're doing everything but trusting in God. Just let's leave that one out. We've got a problem, don't we? Well, we've got a problem. We're all, I did everything else. I just, I just wasn't trusting God. Then you've got a huge issue. But I only, I only left out one. You've got an issue. Let's just not acknowledge God. 
I trust him. Trust who? I don't know. I don't even acknowledge him. We've, we're still in trouble, aren't we? Well, let's just take out one of these things and we're still, we're still in a pickle. These three verses hold the key to a healthy mindset. If your thought patterns can be directed to negativity, so can your life. The battle's right here and Satan knows where to fight. He knows what he wants to do. If, he, if you can think you're something you're not, then you will behave like something you're not. If you can think that you have no value, then you will behave as if you have no value. The, battle, the battle's happening right here. If he can get you in a rut and you make sure you feel comfortable staying there because that's what you think you're worth, then that's the only place you will ever do anything is in that rut. Negativity breeds negativity. He wants you there. He definitely wants you there. But if you can understand that you are blessed beyond measure, it will be an almost impossible task to take you down. If you can get there. Yeah, but all the bad things are happening. I know. But who are you? Are you blessed? It's hard to focus on the blessing when you're going through the depression, right? It's hard to focus on the blessings when your, your circumstances are not good. We start focusing on the circumstances. Ask Peter, how does that work out for you? Well, I was on the water and I was walking on the water and it was working out great. Nobody else is doing this but Jesus. Walking on the water, I'm walking on an ocean, a storm all around me, incredible moment. Why did you sink? Because I looked at the circumstances. <laughs> rather than understand I am over blessed. I'm walking on water, how much more can I be blessed? I'm walking on the circumstances with the Son of God and then I got my mind focused on the circumstances and I started to sink. If Satan can get you to focus on the circumstances, you forget the one walking on them with you. You, you forget about it. Satan wants us to go towards negativity. I want to go back in time to around 60 AD for a few minutes here. <clears throat> Paul the Apostle is sitting in prison for crimes he did not commit. Paul is preaching the gospel. People are not happy about what he's preaching, so now he's in prison. He's been beaten, and the flesh has been removed from his back, which I'm so glad society doesn't do that anymore. But they took, take the whip and they remove the, the flesh and the meat off of his back. So now he's sitting in prison, beaten, and, and extremely sore. His living situation in the dungeon was unsanitary. In college, I, 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 spent, I did my time in college. <laughs> I served it, I, and I got out on good behavior. <clears throat> oh, I got out. But I went to, in, in college, they told us that the lower part of the prison, the uh, lower part of these prisons, was often where the sewage would drain in these, in these dungeons. This is the part where Paul would have been held, in the inner prison, in the, in the dungeon part. Paul knows that his own execution is in the near future. He's got that in his mind. He knows what's coming. Remember, he hasn't done anything wrong. He's not done anything wrong, but he's in prison. All he has been doing is preaching the gospel and it's made certain people angry. In this prison, Paul chooses to write a letter to the church of Philippi. This is, the, this is what we know as the book of Philippians. I want to read a portion of this letter to you. Don't forget where Paul's located when he's writing these letters, okay? When he's writing this letter here. Don't forget his situation. He's in a lot of pain. He's sitting in a sewage system and he didn't do anything to deserve any of this and he decides to write a letter I want to read a portion of that Philippians chapter 4 in verse 8 <coughs> finally brethren whatever things are true whatever things are noble whatever things are just whatever things are pure whatever things are lovely whatever things are of good report if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy meditate on these things now place yourself in Paul's shoes for just a second. Put yourself in, in his situation there. You're cold, you're in pain, you've been falsely accused, you're waiting to be executed, and you decide to write down your thoughts. Something tells me that these aren't the thoughts most of us would be writing down. <laughs> like, okay, oh, that hurts to do that. 
you know what, I'm going to write about this. I'm going, to, I'm going to put my thoughts on paper right now. Chances are we wouldn't be saying, hey, whatever things are lovely, the things are a good report, if it's virtuous, if it's anything praiseworthy, let's focus on that. Chances are that's not what we would be writing. In reality, if we really put ourselves in that situation, like, you know what, I might have, write, I might have wrote a couple of different things. <laughs> Maybe not that. Focus on what's, on what's true, lovely, noble, just. Focus on what's praiseworthy, the things that are virtuous. What we have here is a man who is completely consumed with his relation, the relationship that he has with Christ, and it outshines everything else. Everything else. For some reason, Paul can't be shaken. I'm telling you, that situation that he was in would shake most of us. But Paul could not be shaken. He's lost everything and he's, he's now existing in a situation that most people would describe as God forsaking them. And, and we know that's true. We might want to say, well, I would be like Paul. I, every one of us want to say that. But we also know in the reality that we go through circumstances that are much less than this and we don't handle it as well as he handled it. So praise God that he was able to do that, but Try to put yourself in this situation just for a few minutes here. He sits down and he begins to write one of the most encouraging and joy-filled letters in the entire Bible, the book of Philippians. I want you to see a few more things that he writes in this letter. Look at Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Who's saying that? Paul? In that situation? God is worthy of our praise even if our circumstances are not. I'm not going to praise my circumstances because there is nothing praiseworthy in that. So what does Paul say? Focus on what is praiseworthy. Who's that? God. And he's amazing. We have been so blessed. Praise God for that. What if I'm in a dungeon, in a sewer situation with the flesh missing off my back? I'm cold. I'm lonely. I'm waiting for an execution. Is God good? all the time. Focus on that. Focus on that. Look at verse 6 of uh, chapter 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Stop worrying. Stop worrying. Tell God what's on your mind, but remember, do it with thanksgiving. Do it with thanksgiving. I'm supposed to be thankful for everything? Absolutely not. But you're supposed to be thankful in everything. What if I'm in that situation? Be thankful in that situation. Fear and worry cannot exist in the presence of thankfulness. Just soak that up for just a second. If you have a thankful heart, what don't you have? Anxiety and fear. You can't, they can't exist with thanksgiving. So Paul is writing this letter I'm going to do it with a thankful heart. I'm focused on the good, not the bad. Thank God. For what, Paul? What are you thankful for? You're, you know your execution's coming. You know what's going to happen the very next second after my execution? Because of everything God did, everything Christ did, guess what's happening next? I get to be in the presence of God and I don't get to feel this anymore. I don't carry this anymore. Yes, my desire is to be with you and to teach you and help you grow. But oh my goodness, my desire is also to be there. In the, in, look at my Savior face to face. But what, what about your circumstances? What about them? Peter was walking on a storm and started focusing on the storm instead of on the Savior. What happened to him? He started sinking. And Jesus is saying, hey, where's your faith? Where's your faith? You know what a storm can do. And you also see what I can do. Why'd you take door number one? instead of door number two. Why didn't you focus on me? Paul is telling us, have that thankful heart. In everything, give thanks. Paul is in a place where most people would be anxious and fearful. This is where he pens these words. In that situation, be thankful, talk to God, but do it with thanksgiving. Because there's no room for anxiety or fear when your heart is full of thanksgiving. There, there's no place for it. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 12. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound 
Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, a lot of people take this verse out of context and say, okay, I'm going to jump off that building and fly because I can do all things through Christ. Whoa, 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 whoa. Context will save your life. It's not saying that you can do all these impossible things because Christ will strengthen you. No, the context is I know how to, I know how to be abased and I know how to be abound. I know how to abound. I know how to have everything and still have focus on God. And I know how to have nothing and I can still move forward and focus on God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whether I have everything going my way or everything not going my way, I can be content because I still have him in that situation. Context will save your life if you were thinking about jumping off a building or something like that. I just saved your life, you're welcome. Context, keep it in context. Paul had learned to have plenty and he learned how to have nothing. He knew that he could be content in both situations because he had Christ at all times. He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. I can make it through this and I can make it through that. I can do all things. Why? Because he's still here. He's still here. He didn't get his strength or security from his circumstances. He found them in his relationship with Christ. Somehow the Philippian church is receiving a letter from the motivational speaker of the year. (laughs) And we wouldn't have picked Paul for that in that situation. Who's going to be the one to motivate you? Paul the Apostle. Where's he at? He's in a dungeon waiting for his execution. He's hurting so bad. And he's the motivational speaker of the year? How, how's that? He's writing a letter to them encouraging them not to allow circumstances to govern their lives. Don't forget that you have been over-blessed. Don't forget that. God has loved you and he's relentless about loving you. He's not slowing down. He's continuing to pour that out on you. You are over blessed. Don't lose focus. You are over blessed. God didn't just do something nice for you. He made you joint heirs with Christ. That's kind of a big deal. That's, that's amazing. He has removed your sins as far as east is from west. Your sins and iniquities will he remember no more. Grace has shown up and it relentlessly covered you in God's love. Don't lose focus. Don't lose focus. Yeah, but my circumstances, they're just circumstances. They're just circumstances, but they're really heavy. Understood. Understood. We've all been through that. We've all been through that. When the opportunity presents itself, I love saying this to people. I say, how you doing? Well, I'm doing good under the circumstances. And I love to say, what are you doing under there? You have a God who can walk on the circumstances. What are you doing under them? You don't have to spend time there. The church in Philippi was extremely worried about Paul as they should be. They loved him. It was because of Paul that many of them had come to know the Lord. They, they found Christ because of Paul's ministry. Now he sits in a place that threatens his own life. These people are scared for him and he knows it. Look at how he opens up his letter to these Philippians. Look at what he says in chapter 1, verse 12. <clears throat> but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident in my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He starts his letter out by celebrating his devastating circumstances. Are you okay? Oh, you got to hear what this is. You know, it actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Everything I'm going through is, this is great. This is great because the gospel's getting out farther. While he's sitting in prison, people are getting saved. The word is getting out that he's suffering unjustly and he's doing it to get this important message out to the world. Other Christians are being encouraged by Paul's perseverance and are speaking more boldly than ever before. So Paul's like, yes. Like, are you out of your mind? Why are you celebrating in this situation? Because people are hearing the Word of God and people are being more bold about the Word of God. 
And even the palace guards are listening. I didn't have a chance yesterday to talk to the palace guards, but because I'm missing some flesh on my back, I get to be in this situation, and they're listening too. Praise God. Praise God for this. He says his chains are in Christ. That means, just absorb this, that means he is actually captivated by what God has done for him, not by what the prisoner the prison guards are doing to him. My chains are in Christ. That's what's got me captivated. It's because of what Christ has done. That's got my attention. What about this situation? Ah, forget that. Look what I have. I am captivated. My chains are in Christ. It's his love. It's what he did for me that's got my attention right now. The Romans who are holding Paul prisoner are also getting to hear the gospel. But because of Paul's unjust circumstances, he was able to take the gospel to the very top of the Roman Empire. And he made an incredible impact while he was there. <clears throat> Look at how Paul closes this letter to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 21. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially... <laughs> Those who are of Caesar's household. What? Who? The Roman Caesar? Yeah, they said hi. How'd that happen? Because my chains are in Christ, and they see that. They see that. Paul was able to shine the light of Christ to the household of Caesar himself. Paul is not writing a letter of depression and negativity. Book of Philippians, you want to be encouraged? Read that and understand where he's writing it from. He's writing a letter of encouragement and celebration. And he's writing it while sitting in a sewer with the flesh missing from his back waiting to be executed. That's incredible. That's incredible. When the Philippian church finally received this letter, they must have been floored. Like, who wrote this? <laughs> Paul? Yeah, it says that, but who wrote this? There's no way he's on top of all this. Yeah, because he's not focused on these chains. He's focused on these chains. My chains are in Christ. I win. I win. They knew what he was going through, and yet he's encouraging them to press on. Don't get discouraged. Don't lose hope. Don't look at the circumstances, guys. Press on. Press on. How did Paul do it? And how can we do it? That's the question. Because we know he did it. <laughs> Good for him. How do I do that? How do I do that? How does a man go through everything that Paul went through and still come out on top. How's he do it? It was only possible because he knew who he was and he knew what was done for him. And that's where his focus remained. He was completely consumed with his relationship with Christ. And nowhere in this letter do we find him asking, what did I do to deserve this? <clears throat> you know when bad things happen to us, what do we do? Why do I deserve this? Why, why does this have to happen to me? I, I don't like what I'm in. And then we start asking God, why? Why? Paul's not asking why. He's just praising God. I know bad things happen. We're in a sinful world. Negative things are going to come our way. That's fine. It's going to happen. There's going to be people who are sick. We're going to lose people in our life. Our finances are going to crumble because we have teenagers. And they eat. We understand. We understand things are coming our way. We get that. We get that. That's just life. That's just life. And Paul says, okay, all of that just comes at us. What are you focused on in all that? Where are you focused? Paul refused to focus on the negative. And he focused on the love he received from God. I will not, I will not focus on the negative. God's already absolutely in love with us. He loves the person sitting where you are sitting right now. He is absolutely in love with you. You are the apple of his eye. And he, all he wants us to do is love him in return. This is about a relationship. I love you. I love you too. 
What about what you're going through? Are you still here? Yeah, I'm still there. Let's, let's focus on that. Let's focus on that. Are you going to leave? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will hold you. I'm as close to you as I will ever be. We are, you, I'm not going anywhere. Even if the circumstances get bumpy, let's ride it out together. Let's do it. I'm not leaving you. I'm so glad my chains are in Christ rather than in the circumstances. He offers us a life of peace, but we often get our minds focused on things that bring the opposite result. We do get our minds focused on the circumstances sometimes. Look at what it says in Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. What about your circumstances? No problem, I still trust him. I still trust him. This was the secret to Paul's success. He kept his mind on Christ. He trusted God even in the prison environment that he was in, he still trusted God. The big question is how do we do that? We all know what it's like to have a bad day explode into a bad week or a bad month or a bad year. We've all, we've all had that happen. Oh my goodness, is it just gonna keep getting worse? Looks like it, looks like it. Tomorrow, I don't know, it's not looking good. Tomorrow's not looking good. It's, it looks like it's gonna get really rough. Okay, we all understand that. We all understand what it's like. We all know what it feels like when finances get out of control or relationships start falling apart or we experience loss or suffering of some kind. We all understand that. Circumstances get heavy at times and that's just the reality of it. So how did Paul get to the place where he was able to write this letter? How, how did he get there? And how can we have that same mindset? Let's go ahead and break Proverbs 3, 5 through 7 down a little bit more. And let's just look at this. Don't lose any of this. Let's just look at this. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. This is the first step. Can you trust him? That seems like a simple question with an obvious answer. So let me ask it in a different way. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Or are you leaning on your own understanding? Do you trust that how God says to handle things is the right way, or do you handle things the way you want to in the moment? <laughs> Which way do you lean? Which way do you lean? It would be good for all of us <clears throat> to take a moment to examine how we conduct our lives just right now. It'd be a good idea to just focus in on this. Do we trust that God can use us as part of the solution or do we try to solve things on our own? Because <laughs> I know there's been many times in my life where I thought, I got this. Only to find out that now I have two problems. <laughs> trust him. Do you trust, not can you trust him? Yes, you can trust him. But do you trust him? Are you trusting him? God can shine through us in every situation. So the question is not, can he, but will we let him? Will we let him do the shining? Sin desires to have you yield to it. Christ also desires to have you yield to him. Will you yield? At any given moment, you get the choice of which side you will let lead. Every, every moment, you get, you get a chance. Sin will be offered to you. Here's a temptation to sin. You can let sin reign, or you can let Christ reign. In every situation, you get those two options. Like, here you go. Do you want to you handle it this way? Like, no. See, I'm not made for that anymore. I'm not made for sin anymore. I don't, I don't have to do that. I'm so much better than that now because of what he did for me. Uh, my chains are going to be in Christ. I'm not bound to this anymore. I'm dead to sin, and I'm alive to God. I choose that. But sometimes we say, God, look, that just seems to be the way. My own understanding says this is how to handle it, so um, I'm going to lean this way and we get in trouble. Sin desires to have you all the time. God desires you to yield to him all the time. <clears throat> we can yield to the temptation of sin or we can allow Christ to show his character through our lives at any given moment. But the second option will never happen if we don't first allow this next piece of advice to kick in. Are you gonna yield to God well, let's look at the next piece. Proverbs 3, 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him. 
and he shall direct your paths. When we get to the place where we acknowledge him in all our ways or in all of our actions, we will begin to live a completely different lifestyle. When you start seeing him in the circumstances rather than just seeing the circumstances, things start to change. When someone is currently attacking our lives or has in the past, do we acknowledge the Lord in that event? Typically, no. You start yelling at me, what do we do? Well, we yell back. You attack me, what do we do? I attack back. Let's say it's happening right now. Are you going to acknowledge him in the way you respond? Do we acknowledge him in the way we respond? Let's say it's something that happened a long time ago. Are you acknowledging him in the way you're offering forgiveness? As, yeah. This is where some people are like, you can stop preaching now. <laughs> now we're getting a little close to home. Yeah, that person really did me wrong, and I really have a hard time forgiving them. Yeah, so I, what I'm asking is, can you acknowledge him in the way you're offering forgiveness? <clears throat> you see, you've been blessed by a God who refuses to stop blessing you. And he forgave you when he could have just walked away. And then he told us to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. And sometimes that doesn't match up with our own understanding. I like, know they need to hurt. Yeah, I get it. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. So let him do his job and you do your job. Let it go. Let it go. Do you trust him with this advice? Is he being acknowledged in the way you handle life from moment to moment? If not, Solomon does give us this next verse to help reel us in. Look at the next verse, verse 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Do not be wise in your own eyes. This one hurts when we know we are in the wrong. Okay? Sometimes we know we're in the wrong. We know it's wrong to hold on to the anger, but we don't want to let it go. We want to be angry. We all know we've been there. Like, hey, let it go. No, right now, I insist. I am going to be miserable. I am going to be angry. I'm going to live here right now. Why? Are you enjoying it? No. Then why would you insist on staying there? Because they deserve to see my wrath. Yeah, you laugh because you've been there. <laughs> like, yes, right now I'm going through that, so move along, move along. There's no wisdom in that. We just feel a sense of justice by holding the other person in that mental prison. And when we do this, we eventually become bitter and negative ourselves. Remember, you're not ruining that person by the way you feel. You're destroying yourself by the way you feel. We may be able to acknowledge that it's wrong to feel this way, but we also refuse to let it go because it feels so right to hold on to that grudge. Well, there's your understanding. And then there's the don't lean on that and acknowledge him. You can do that part. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Show admiration to the Lord by departing from evil. There's something very important for us to understand about sin in the Christian life. It doesn't belong there, and we know it. it. It doesn't belong there. Even if it's a secret sin, it begins to show through your behavior. Maybe you have a secret sin going on. Nobody knows about it. <clears throat> By the way, somebody knows about it. You might think, oh, I'm getting away with this. Nobody knows about this. Well, if you're involved in sin, you treat those around you negatively. It's going to start coming through your character. It's going to change you. We all know how we behave when we're sick, right? Everybody's looking at somebody else. <laughs> They're like, <clears throat> listen to this. We all know what we behave like when we're sick. We aren't necessarily as pleasant as we usually are <laughs> because we feel like something's wrong. We're miserable. Child of God, the same kind of thing happens when you're allowing the parasite of sin to hang on in your life. It doesn't belong. You're better than that. And the longer you allow that to be part of your life, 
the more you're going to start handling things and treating people in a way because it's affected your character. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Before we were saved, sin was our go-to solution for when we felt uh, we were done wrong in some way. Our sin was our go-to, right? That's what we went to. Well, Christ is our go-to now. That, that's what we're supposed to do. Go to Christ. When we operate outside the parameters of our relationship with Christ, we feel distant and we feel a loss of value. We aren't distant from God at this point and we're no less valuable than we were before, but we sure do feel spiritually unhealthy at that point. We feel distant. You're not. I feel like I have no value. You, you do. You start to feel spiritually unhealthy when you allow that sin to reign in that moment. If you're saved, you are a prisoner of love just like Paul was. That's, that's where you are. Paul chose to focus on that detail above all the other details. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind to understand that you are secure in Christ and you have been blessed beyond measure. Yeah, God adores you. He adores you. Like, yeah, but he doesn't adore me right now because of what I did. What you did is not what you are. He still adores you. He doesn't like that. So what does he tell you to do? Stop it. Stop. Yeah, but what do I need to do to clean that up? I've already done that. You stop doing that. Start acting like what you are. You're a child of God. Act like it. Life is just what's happening all around us. But it can be affected because we're in the middle of it. Sin desires to take you captive even though it's been rendered powerless because of the cross. It still wants to take you down. The enemy wants you to be discouraged because of the circumstances. He also wants you to be held prisoner by your own bitterness and unforgiveness. And that's, by the way, who you throw in prison is you, not the other person. It's time to stand up and be bold about the fact that we are prisoners of love. That's, that's who we are. And it's an eternal life sentence. Praise God. I can't even get out of this thing. <laughs> he loves me and there's no way out. I can't even pay bail. I can't get out of his love because he absolutely adores you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Talk to God with thanksgiving. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. Depart from sin. It just ruins your character and causes shame. You're a prisoner of love. Enjoy it. Enjoy it and encourage others because of it. You never know. Your testimony may reach the household of Caesar one day. You never know. You never know. Once a person is saved, they are no longer slaves to sin. They are no longer to be ruled by circumstances. This is what God says. Romans 6.18 And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You are prisoner of love. Welcome home. Welcome home. You have been overblessed. And God is ridiculously in love with you. He loves you so much. We are prisoners of an unyielding love. That is our identity, and that needs to be our focus. I challenge everyone to try this out this week. Please, try this out. When negativity shows up, and it will, focus your mind on God's love. In that moment, focus on God's love. When anxiety starts to build up, start giving thanks and change your focus. I'm worried, I'm worried. God, thank you for never leaving me nor forsaking me. Thank you that you walk on the water and I don't have to drown under the circumstances. Thank you for loving me when I was unlovable. Thank you that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. Thank you for making me new. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. What's not happening? Worry, 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 worry. Because worry cannot exist in a thankful heart. It cannot, there's, no, there's no place for both of them. It's like wet fire. 
You can't have that. You cannot have that. They can't coexist. So thank God. Change your focus. You are a prisoner of love. You are a prisoner of love. Just do your time. And by the way, that's eternity. Praise God. Praise God. You are a prisoner of love. Don't let the circumstances get you down. You are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Live it up. Live it up and enjoy it.